Thank you so much for joining us today. Nearly every facet of the media profession is negatively impacted by disinformation. Often we focus the attention of fake news on the media itself, but in reality, public relations is greatly impacted as well. A survey of communication professionals found that 21% said their organizations and reputations have been impacted by fake news. Today, we're gonna to explore how public relations professionals can debunk and fight back against disinformation. I'm Dr. Temple Northup. I'm the director of the School of Journalism and Media Studies at San Diego State University. Our media school is bringing you today's webinar with a lot of help from our friends. This session is co-hosted by the Public Relations Society of America, San Diego Imperial Counties chapter in partnership with the San Diego Union Tribune, iNewsource, the San Diego Public Library System, and the San Diego chapter for the Association of Black Journalists. This is the second of five disinfecting disinformation webinars this month we'll offer. Today's webinar brings seasoned communicators who have faced more than a career's worth of disinformation. We will hear some outrageous stories, but even better, find out how organizations can actively fight back against disinformation. We encourage you to share your outtakes from today on social media. Please use our hashtag disinfectingdisinfo or tag at PRSA San Diego and at SDSU underscore JMS to join the conversation. Our panel starts as a moderated conversation and then we'll open up to questions and answers. So that we can cover as many topics as possible, we aren't gonna spend a lot of time introducing each panelist. As you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Our moderator today is Barb Cosio Moreno from PRSA San Diego Imperial Counties. Barb will be leading our conversation. Welcome, Barb. Thank you. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm a board member with the PRSA San Diego Imperial Counties chapter and very grateful uh, to be a part of this panel. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, uh, our panelists are incredibly impressive, bringing their years of expertise in public relations, military communications, and government communications. Charles Chamberlain is the founder and principal at Chamberlain PR. It's a firm that specializes in public affairs, strategic communications, crisis communications, and issues management. He's also a former, for, excuse me, former spokesperson for three U.S. senators and a U.S. mayor. And Chloe Morgan is a U.S. Navy spokesperson and public affairs officer who has her APR, uh, her accreditation in public relations and military communications. So welcome to both of you. Uh, to everyone joining us during this panel, I encourage you as your questions come to mind, please put them in the chat box, or sorry, the Q&A box. I'll be looking at that and, um, and as really good questions come up, I will uh, put them into this conversation. Uh, we don't wanna just save all the great questions for the end. So um, let's get right into this. Uh, one of the first questions I have for, the, for our panel is, um, as a communications director in the past, I always had a crisis communications plan that was on the shelf and was there when I needed it. Uh, I hoped I never had to reach for it. But I kind of think that now it's the thing you need to practice and have with you at all times. And I would open it up to both of you and say, what do you think about that? Absolutely, I agree that it's important to prepare for these rainy day kind of situations. But with disinformation, you never know what to predict what's gonna happen. You don't know when China's gonna blame COVID on a US military reservist visiting China for the military games. That actually happened. We don't have a plan for that. And similarly, we won't for a lot in the future. So more so, I think it's about uh, creating a framework to help you come ahead with disinformation because you don't know when it's gonna happen. It hits you, how are you gonna do it? Um, and so I've done some research uh, with some teammates of mine back at SDSU and what we looked at is the best ways as PR practitioners to kind of uh, work disinformation. And what we found is first off, you have to be timely, right? You can't have disinformation out there for a while. Uh, timeliness matters. So as PR practitioners, making sure that you have access to that C-suite so that you can get those statements approved so you can get the real account of events from your subject matter experts, that's critically important. But then how do we answer? 
Well, a lot of research says that uh, painting a clear picture to show why your side is truthful and why the other side is distruthful is super important. And what we found through research is actually refutation where you deny this aggressor's claim um, at the same time of painting a picture of what actually happened helps you. Also, adding an image too, it cuts through that disinformation and helps build a picture in your head. Um, so those are some really important tools. So I implore people when they're thinking about uh, preparing for disinformation, it's just about having those processes in place and seeing uh, maybe how your statement, how your side of events can overcome what's being said about you. I had a chance to study uh, crisis communications back in uh, grad school at Johns Hopkins and uh, actually got to study under the, one of the founding members of the crisis communications, which is, his name was Nick Nichols, one of the founders of Denzen Hall, which is a big firm in Washington, D.C. And they came up with a model for addressing these situations. And the number one thing that you can do to help uh, prevent and tackle uh, a crisis is to push your perceived benefits. Push the, establish credibility and tell everyone why you are important or why you're there. Um, I work with a number of organizations over the years. Some are in the middle of crisis, some are after, some are working after crisis. And the number one thing you have to do is establish that credibility and build it. Continue to tell people why you're beneficial to them. Because once you cross that crisis membrane into people kind of going crazy and uh, not really, all of, all, anything that's cognitive, anything that's rational, does not work afterwards. And it's all about emotion. So if you can beforehand establish, oh, well, you're important because of this. Oh, I know I'm using this product because it helps me do this or helps me do that. Then you can help maintain or literally uh, manage a crisis in the future. That's really great. I was, um, I was thinking about trust. Um, I remember going into probably 2019, that was one of the top things that uh, folks were focusing on way before we even knew of the word, you know, the, the the phrase COVID. But it was about building trust and authenticity in your brand. Um, how do you do that today? And how how do you get it back? Um, it, is there is there something you can do? What is your advice uh, when sort of the the disinformation is already hitting you? Um, what what would you recommend, Charles? It's actually quite simple. It's tell the truth and tell it as soon as possible. Um, I've been in a number of situations where, you know, reporters ask you, what did you do and when did you do it? Get it out then. Because if you're backtracking and there's issues and, you know, you have to, and, and let, stuff comes out later, your credibility is gone. So let everyone know the truth up front, even if it's something bad, right? Because you get it all out the way. And, get, and I would say get out as much as possible. Don't try to you know, get it out in spurts, but get it all the way, take one big hit and then, and then keep moving. The purpose is to establish the truth and establish credibility. Credibility comes sometimes with telling people bad things about yourself, because then people believe you, right? Don't be afraid to let folks know that, you know what, we may have failed in this instance or you know, we didn't do the right thing here because then that also establishes credibility. And at the same time, like looking at truth, a lot of times you don't have a full understanding of the truth in the moment too. So while it's always quick, quick, quick as we can, let's get the information out there. Let's try to stop this disinformation. What's even more perilous for us as communicators is if we get something out there that's wrong. Um, the WHO right now is calling this an infodemic about COVID with there's so much information out there that it's really inserting this kind of confusion. And case in point, um, back in March, the Surgeon General tweeted out, uh, he did a crisis communication kind of strategy where he added emotion into his tweet and said, do not wear masks, do not, save them for the doctors, right? And that was the information we had at the time. It made perfect sense. That was his way. By using that emotion, it really cut through everyone else saying, buy them, buy them, buy them. But now we're in a problem here where people go, hey, that information was put out in March. Therefore, nothing we can believe from the authorities is true. So I really caution people to think of when you're releasing, it's difficult. And I don't know what I would do in their situation when it came to the masks 
But for us in the military, if we have one of our facts wrong, right, that puts a hole entirely into our case and it makes it so the adversary wins. Even if the adversary is China, Russia, Iran, who continuously lies, if the United States says one, if, if we misstep one little bit, that makes it so people won't believe us. And to what Charles is saying, it ruins our, our credibility, our brand, our reputation. Um, so just make sure as you're going through that timeliness, make sure what you say is accurate and it's not gonna hurt your efforts in the future. Good point. Um, as far as disinformation goes, uh, what is the advice you have for combating it within your own, own organization. Um, interested to hear what your thoughts are, Chloe, uh, when it comes to the military. But knowing that your uh, employees may be the first ones to tell you something's going on that you might not be aware of, um, how do you manage that, your, your audience versus your ambassadors inside? That's exactly right. You know, every, every sailor is an ambassador of the Navy and making sure they get it right. And it's sometimes hard when we're doing uh, wartime or operational planning because only a few people in the organization will have a full picture of what's going on because we're trying to protect the security of the mission. Um, at the same time, though, I think it goes down deep. That's where the levels of authenticity are. If these are your spokespeople, if it's the junior person out there that's able to speak on something, right? I could put a statement out there all day. It says, Chloe Morgan, U.S. Navy spokesman. And as soon as it says U.S. Navy spokesman, everyone's like, what, this is something garbage. This is something that's been well rehearsed and well planned. Um, so really it's about working with our troops to make sure that there's some level of media literacy too. Um, because many times it is our sailors that are watching the same news sources that we are and are getting totally different views of what's going on depending on what news station they subscribe to. Um, so being, again, what Charles says, it's all about that reputation. Well, we've got to have a good reputation within the organization as well and make it seem that our commanders are telling them exactly what's happening so that they can believe in the purpose of what they're doing. Yeah, and to piggyback off of what Chloe is saying is external communication and internal communication are so important. That's why you'll find sometimes when you're looking at corporate communications, you'll notice that some corporations actually have a direct of communications for internal communications. Because when you get so big, everyone has to have the same information. Everyone has to have uh, the same ground rules. And so when I, when I walk into, I deal with a lot of crises with my current, uh, with my current uh, company. And the first thing we try to do is set ground rules. The second thing we do is make sure that everybody's receiving the same information. So if you have a news release that goes out in your organization, everyone should, cheat, should see it. When a statement goes out, send the statement to, the, to, to everyone so that they know that you know, this is how we're addressing the situation and it can prevent you know, others from going to news sources and giving their own take. Um, so internal communications is critical. And so many times things are developing so quick too that it's just as Charles says, if you at least give them access to whatever releases or statements you're putting out in real time, that helps because you don't always have time for the CEO or in my case, the military commander to get everyone all together and tell them exactly what's happening. So if we can use those products internally and externally, um, it shows that we're not hiding anything. Um, but I do suggest when we're doing internal comms, if there is an opportunity for that CEO to really get down there and talk to people um, so that they understand what's happening, that's just gonna build a better foundation of trust. For sure. I find myself more often than not encouraging CEOs and executives to issue memos. Memos are so important, they're not dead. They're important to making people feel like they're a part of an organization. And that, again, like Chloe says, that, they're not, that you're not hiding anything. Yeah, that's, that's a really great point. And as far as advice um, for CEOs or leadership of companies, I'm curious what you think, because we've all been at that point where it takes, you know, forever to get an approval or you can't reach the right person that needs to sign off on a statement um, or a quote. And uh, just curious kind of what, how do, how do we have to rethink the way those approval processes go? Um, unfortunately, it depends upon the organization. I mean, 
Uh, if you're dealing with a large organization, it's got to be organic. Uh, you've got to go from the bottom up. You've got the people on the ground that are seeing things that are happening. I often like to start with those folks. So that way you get, uh, you, you get a viewpoint of those that are on the ground and then you slowly go up through the ranks to get it, uh, to get it approved. And, and sometimes that statement changes and sometimes there's disagreement. But at the end, I think the important thing is looping it back around and letting everyone know this is what was approved. Um, so that way there isn't any um, uh, conflicts in terms of what people's interpretations of the statement is. And a PR person is only as good as their connections, right? We've heard that said a million times. I work in an office right now where I don't really look like anybody. Uh, they're all operators, they all do really cool things. Uh, they speak in acronyms that I am just furiously trying to understand, right? But you find a few ends that are helping you, that are you know telling you exactly what's happening as they see it on the ground. And again, like having that access with your commander. I've been at commands where they see public affairs as, oh, you know, you just do the press, or you do a Navy.mil article. And then I see others that are moving you know, the public affairs office right next to their office because they realize the importance. So when we need to be expedient, when we need to reach everyone, you just have to have those really good connections. Um, and it has to be authentic too, right? You can, you can pretend to be that PR person that's bringing in coffee and bringing in cookies and all these things. They're gonna see right through it. So um, once you kind of build that trust with them, build that rapport. It's all about having them because they know so many more of the details than we'll ever know. Our job is translating those details to the public. Right. And that's a good, uh, that's a good tool to use in this, in combating disinformation because you, you, then you internally, your job is to go to the source um, to really figure out what's what, right? So that's a really good point, Chloe. Um, we have a question from uh, Elizabeth. Question is, how can we combat message fatigue, especially when it comes to COVID? I think you have to define message fatigue. Um, that's, the, that's the really hard thing about messaging is saying and repeating the same thing over and over again, because people don't get it. It's not people's jobs to pay attention to what I'm saying when I'm with this company or when uh, Chloe's with the Navy, you know, people, you know, have their daily lives and we repeat these things over and over again because we hope that at one point in time between them taking care of their kids or and watching the news and doing whatever it is, walking the dog, that they may hear what we have to say. So unfortunately, um, hammering away at a message, it's critical, even if they're tired of it. They'll never, don't worry about that literally keep hammering away because when they're tired of it is that's when it's going to that's when it's going to uh, uh get through yeah, yeah to that point consistency right if you're consistent in your message that lends to those trust and credibility principles so if you are the cdc making sure that you put out you know whatever your continued drumbeat is um but I get it. I think we all kind of have message fatigue when it comes to COVID and we're all just like waiting on a vaccine. Uh, I need to turn off the news. I, for example, when this first started happening, uh, I was nine months pregnant and I think I watched the news 14 hours a day. That was unhealthy. I wasn't getting good and good information. Instead, I was just panicking um, and trying to make a nest, right? Well, that's everybody right now. Everyone, people with kids in school trying to figure out how to navigate that. Um, and then I love just going between the different news channels to see how they're portraying different, different things. So how do you cut through that? How do you get through the message fatigue? I think it's just being true to your brand and being true to whatever your brand would say or believe and not worrying so much about people being tired about it, but consistency builds trust. Right. And I've heard, I think it's the, the measurement is you have to hear something like seven times before you, you retain information. So um, I think it takes a toll on us as the communicators because we are saying it over and over and we kind of get tired of hearing uh, ourselves. But you have to remember, um, to both of your points, people are out there doing, they're living their lives. They're not, uh, unless they're in a, in a situation where they're watching TV <laughs> all day long, they're probably dealing with a million things. And so to us, we've said it over and over, but they need to hear it 
I think the biggest thing that's an asset to us for as communicators, and this is going to sound crazy, but it's the truth, is understanding that people generally don't care about what we have to communicate. When you understand that principle, then you become that much more effective because then you, A, you have to work at getting the attention of those people. You have to be consistent. And, you know, you, you realize that not everyone's just trying to be receptive to your message, right? We've all had that experience of trying to get, we thought something was so great and we thought we could get someone to write about it, but then you know, nothing happened. And, you know, just understand that general principle, um, I think, lends to credibility, uh, lends, uh, is, does us a big favor as communicators. And then maybe too, it's not so much about what we say when there's a lot of information out there, right? If you're just being bombarded with information, maybe it's giving people the tools to understand and evaluate the information for themselves. No one wants to be told what to believe. People want to come to the conclusion on their own. And you look at countries, uh, Finland ranks number one for media literacy programs. And what they do that's really effective is they don't just target school age children. They have classroom settings for senior citizens, for middle-aged people, but really they try to take like a whole society approach. And I think we're all talking about media literacy. I think we all agree that it's important. It's just trying to figure out how to do it. But if you look at a country like Finland that's been bombarded by, you know, disinformation from Russia, that's, that does give us something to look at. Because if we can teach people, you know, how to evaluate information for themselves, then maybe they're a little less susceptible to all the noise going around them. I like that whole society approach. That's great. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I had never heard that before. I have a question for, for you from John. Uh, the question is, as PR practitioners, we have the unique challenge of accountability compared to some sources of disinformation. How do you, count, how do you counter the virility of a disinformation campaign? Would you release multiple explanatory messages or one consistent and repeated response? I think you kind of already answered this, but I just wanted to make sure John's question got on the record. Yeah. Chloe, do you want to get this one? I mean, I like consistency. Yeah. We were just talking about information overload. And sure, you want to tell people everything, but it, think of you with your boss, right? If you give your boss an update on everything, sir, I just did a press release. Sir, I just sent out a photo. Sir, I did this. Isn't it better sometimes at the end of the day just tell him exactly what's going on and what really matters? Because otherwise you're kind of that annoying dog biting at the ankles. We want people to really internalize these messages. So that's why timeliness is important. But let's get as much information as we can out there on that first hit. Because most of the time, I mean, that's what we're fine with disinformation. is because how easy it is to believe the first thing you're told, right? So if we're telling them a million different things, they go, I can't cognitively process that. I need to just put that away. Let's make it easy for people to understand and be that consistent message. I think as a political, uh, a once political communicator, um, I have an interesting take on it. Um, at one point in time, I was being interviewed for the NFL as one of their communicators. Um, at the time, Ari Fleischer had just finished up with the Bush administration and he was trying to pull people from Capitol Hill. And I happened to be one of the guys he pulled. And we sat down to lunch and I said, well, why, why are you pulling people from Capitol Hill? And he's like, well, we're the only people that actually tell our principals what to do. Um, and I actually think that should be done across the PR spectrum, meaning that we're not just responsible for telling them what to say. Um, and if you look at a number of uh, academic studies, there's multiple tactics for dealing with the situation, whether it's inoculation, right? You know, constantly saying the same thing or piling the information on them or cauterization, right? Where you actually tell them, look, I think you have to fire this guy, you know? <laughs> so I think um, it is our responsibility to look at a, situ a situation holistically and give them a real response saying, you know, to deal with the problem, even if it's outside of communication. So we have another question. Uh, this one's from Corinne. Um, and uh, it, it is regarding trolls. You know, this was coming. Uh, so do you see anything problematic about the don't feed the trolls tactic or attitude when handling mis and disinformation online? How can practitioners encourage their bosses to pay more attention to this issue? 
what do you do with the trolls? Oh, that's a hard one. I, I've had so many bosses on Capitol Hill where they have their phones and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, and uh, I, I, I had a boss one time, and this is a US Senator who tweeted out his own Twitter password at one point in time. We were just like, what are you doing, bro? Um, but I think you just have to constantly remind them like it's not helpful, you know? It, you, you know, uh, trolls are trolls and hopefully uh, when you're dealing with rational people, they understand that their base of knowledge is not the same as yours or anybody else that's reputable. So, I mean, we have to just consistently remind our principals, do not engage because it's not helpful to the situation. And I think this land of social media is kind of encouraging us all to be trolls in some way, right? We all have some issues that we're passionate about. We probably have friends on Facebook that feel the opposite way. Um, I know I see this with, with my own family all the time where they think that, hey, I can fight these trolls by doing the same exact thing, right? I love the saying, you know, never wrestle with a pig. The pig likes it and you only end up dirty. That's kind of the situation here. If you find yourself getting involved in all these little nuances, you're really taking, if you're on the defensive instead of being proactive, um, and disinformation naturally puts people on the defensive, but if you can look like you're proactive, if you can remind people, no, 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 this is what we've always believed in, uh, it kind of helps you rise above, but it is really hard. And then you have the added issue of, you know, these fake trolls coming out there that are trying to sow discord. And that's what disinformation is all about. It's trying to put a lot of information out there so that people don't have um, belief in their political institutions or the things that they held so closely before. That's what trolls do to our society. Because yeah. yeah. at the end of the day, our democracy is based on the belief that it actually works. And when you stop believing that the system works, that's when it falls apart. And those trolls that are, that are foreign operatives, they're, they, they've succeeded. Exactly. Um, so I, we got another question. Um, I don't have a first name, just a letter T. Um, but it kind of ties into what we're talking about of the echo chamber. So there's folks who just kind of want to hear what they want to hear. And they, you know, uh, algorithms sort of do this for us automatically. It's like, just starts feeding you what something that that you're used to seeing and that you like seeing so you almost get the reward by seeing the same stories um so how do you actually you know get into other people's echo chambers who may not necessarily want to hear from you mm. uh i think you i think one of the things i was in charge of uh when i was on capitol hill is doing outreach for uh, member in the house leadership and I constantly told them to go out and introduce themselves to new demographics to new um, to new publics um, whether it was whether they were a liberal going on Fox News or a conservative uh, working with or, or, or speaking to the NAACP or Urban League um, it's uncomfortable. It's not. It's it's not easy, and it's hard. But it's something that you have to do. Is just putting yourself in those positions to hear different perspectives, and I think ultimately that's what makes us better people: is conversation and interaction with people that are not like us. I also think it's important too to look outside the box, right? There's so many information sources out there. So you look at the research and it, it looks that people actually um, are supportive and believe their local news, whether that be local TV news, whether that be their local paper, which is sad because a lot of those are closing down right now, but that's one of the highest levels of trust in the media. So as PR practitioners reaching out to that local media to be, to try to get your side of the story, you know, if you can't get it, uh, so many times as PR practitioners, we go, ooh, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, this is the way I can get them, I can cast a wide net over the most amount of people. But that's not always going to help you achieve your objective. If your objective is helping people in Belarus understand that Russia is putting out false information on the fight in ISIS, you know what you need to do? You need to get the Belarus journalists on board a US Navy aircraft carrier and see the fight firsthand. 
And that's actually what we did a lot when I worked with the US Navy in Bahrain. Uh, we worked with the US State Department and we found these journalists. Now these journalists, none of them are Pulitzer Prize winners. A lot of them uh, didn't speak great English. And many of them actually uh, had rarely seldom left their area of the world. This is their first time coming out to the Middle East. But by using those people, by kind of almost a two-step flow process, that's a way that you can be more creative in trying to get out to these target audiences. Because when they're being pun like pummeled by information like RT and Sputnik, how do we get creative and reach them? Because they're not reading Wall Street Journal. They're not reading New York Times. So how can we find the people that trust them? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Chloe um, for the same fact that people have a certain idea of their national politicians or federal politicians and their local politicians. And a lot of it comes down to the fact that local politicians deal with everyday issues that you can see, touch and feel, whereas on the federal level, it's often ideological. So like working with local media groups or even local organizations is, uh, is a great way to try and cross into a new, uh, into a new audience. Yeah, that makes me think of sort of, um, it's something we talked about, uh, the panelists and I talked about previously, we were discussing how COVID has changed really the way um, we are all interacting um, the Zoom, the Zoom rooms and the, all the different online meetings that we're having. Uh, some of us are actually seeing much higher levels of engagement when it comes to government officials. Um, people actually wanting to hear what you have to say and more people joining um, webinars like this. Uh, so it kind of changes that interaction you would probably have with an elected official. Um, do you, either of you see this as a, a well, I don't know, do you think it's here to stay um, post COVID, hopefully someday, uh, where you know, PR folks were used to doing community outreach? Um, how does this change that? Yeah, I, I, this takes me back to, you have these events throughout history that change the trajectory of communications or, to, uh, or just the way we operate as humans. When I was on Capitol Hill during 9-11, no one was able to talk to each other because the cell phone towers went down. Immediately following after that, they switched to the BlackBerry because the BlackBerry had, not because it was, you know, could operate through cell towers, because it had the pin function, which allowed you to talk device to device. And so Blackberries became the thing on Capitol Hill. And that translated to, um, uh, to cell phones and, 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 and more. But I'm sure that this, situation is going to change things for everyone in terms of how we communicate. I think of it as too, I mean, look at this panel right now. I heard we had, you know, over 150 participants. If this were at SDSU in person, I don't think we'd have quite the same turnout. So, right, we're able to cast a wider net over wider populations. But at the same time, how many people that are listening to this panel right now, because this is what I do when I listen to other panels, are also on their cell phone, are also doing other things, are also making coffee in the background, right? So you're actually not, and I'm, I don't want to generalize, right? But for a lot of people, you're not paying as much attention as you would in person. So as us as PR practitioners, right, do they expect more and more access because we facilitated this online kind of discussion? And then if so, how do we catch their attention when they are making their coffee or their kids coming down the stairs? Um, it, it requires us to be a lot more creative when, when everyone has us at, at the reach of your laptop. Yeah, great question. Uh, apparently Andrew feels seen, he just said. <laughs> we caught him. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna ask Andrew's question because um, this is actually a really big, this is a big one. Uh, and it's good for both of you with your experience. So Andrew's question is, um, when it comes to a topic like clim climate change or vaccines, where the problem isn't just one or two trolls, but a whole population that basically attacks your message, um, no matter what it is, is it worth engaging or pushing back or just focusing on the audience that's receptive to your message? <laughs> hmm, that's, that's, a, that's a hard, so, so she, this person's asking about climate change and there's multiple. So like a, yeah, like a big topic, like, you know, you have believers and disbelievers, whether it be mm -hmm. climate change or vaccines or you, what, you know, whatever it is. Uh, 
Yeah. How, I, how would you even, how would you talk to a client? How would you recommend what they do with their message? Mm -hmm. I, I would probably recommend that they work on different mediums to try and reach different audiences. Um, I, I, I think at that point, we're just changing the various arguments that we get to, re to, to reach people um, and, um, and, and really trying to be um, uh, really smart about how we're talking to people because we're working on changing minds and hearts. We're not just pushing out information. Um, so I, I think entering different mediums where you can have a discussion, right? Where you can actually have that one-on-one -on -one discussion with someone and try and, try and convince them with facts and numbers. Um, I think that's helpful. Um, and then talking about the various different ways that, um, that you can hope for, uh, for a message to resonate with someone. So for example, with climate change, while some people, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the polar caps melting may not necessarily hit them one way, but another argument about how um, forests are burning, right, or the temperatures rising, or the fact that it may be causing more as more you know more asthma within people, or you know, working on different avenues that can affect various different audiences and in, in changing the argument. Yeah, and for me too, I think it's also about being in a way of looking at these people not as oh, they're below me. Oh, I'm, you know, that it's very easy to look down on these people who don't believe what science is telling you and you go, they're a lost cause, right? That's not the right way to be because if we, we treat them like that, we're only polarizing, you know, the different sides. And for us in the U.S. Navy, we see it a lot when it comes. So I saw, uh, I believe Admiral McCreary put it on there about sonar and whales, right? So whenever we do this rim of the Pacific exercise in the Pacific, a lot of times we get complaints from many times local Hawaiians that think our sonar is disrupting the whales that are out there, right? It would be really easy for a worker commander that goes, screw them, it doesn't matter. I'm going to keep on talking about how we're ready to fight China or we're ready, we're the greatest military in the world. That's the wrong answer. You've got to communicate. And that's what we do in the Navy is we, we still go to the, these meetings. We still meet with these people. We talk with them, we show them, we bring them on board the ships to show them exactly what we're doing to try to mitigate any effects to the whale populations out there. So it's about, you can't look at these people as, Ugh, they're so dumb. I can't, I can't even handle them. They're not worth my time. No, they're, these are real people. These are real audiences and these are important audiences because um, unlike disinformation, which is a blatant act of deceit, these are cases of misinformation where people truly believe what's being told to them. They're not doing it to try to, you know, ruin Chloe's day uh, or try to, you know, sow the confusion. They actually believe this and we need to respect them enough to see where they're coming from but also find new ways to present the information to them um, so that hopefully they can come again to a decision on their own and hopefully they can see our, our facts. Chloe, you also had, um, you have some experience in dealing with um, countries where the disinformation is actually coming from, you know, the government itself. Um, do you have any, any examples you could share about, you know, what, what you encountered and kind of how you dealt with that? This is probably a small example, but it's one of the ones that gets most under my skin. And it's because disinformation does best when it contains a grain of truth, right? Doing a wild out there lie, people can generally see through that and go, that's not true. That's, that's Russia saying something totally crazy. But it's when they say something that goes, oh, you know what, you're right. And it leads people to think one way or another. Uh, case in point, so I was in Bahrain in the spring of 2019, and that's when things with Iran were really heating up. Uh, the first thing that ended up happening were two ships were attacked outside the Strait of Hormuz. Um, no one knew immediately what caused the attacks. The, these tankers are huge. It's really, all you know is that it, all of a sudden it's flooding and you're taking on water. What causes damage? Well, at the time, I hear about the report and I'm, I'm going to my computer and one of the reporters calls me from the Associated Press and he's, he's on it, man. This guy, there's no fooling him for anything. Well, he found an RT article that said, hey, two ships outside the Strait of Hormuz were just attacked. And then they put this paragraph in there saying, 
US military were overflying at the time, which is true. We fly missions outside and through the Strait of Hormuz all the time. It's international waters, we patrol, we want the free flow of commerce. But just by putting, it, it was only a two paragraph story, you know, what happened and that the US military was around, that was the first thing that got out there on the news. And it instantly sowed doubt of, oh, well, if the US military was around, obviously they did it. What would blow up a ship and you have US military aircraft? Because if US military aircraft were flying over, they wouldn't let this happen. So that, those are the things that are most dangerous to me. It isn't when they have this vivid story or when it's Iran prating through you know, a false missile through their towns. It's when they say something that I have to go as a spokesperson, yeah, AP, that, that's true. We did have aircraft flying over at the time so that they don't come up with the belief, okay, then that must be you. That to me is what's really hard. And countries are getting sophisticated, just like our ways of being able to use artificial intelligence to track uh, trolls, they're getting a lot smarter. On social media, most of the accounts now are using a tactic called camouflage, where um, it's really easy to spot a troll on Twitter when it's only one issue that they care about and they continuously repeat, repeat. But what happens when it's got some authenticity, where it's somebody posing on the beach, where they're talking about Justin Bieber's latest song, and then, oh yeah, they're pummeling Russian disinformation out there. Uh, we got to remember, as we get smarter, so is our adversary. Good point. Um, thank you for that. Next question uh, comes from Gina, going back to the pandemic. Uh, how can we effectively communicate the importance of mitigation strategies like social distancing and masking while also addressing inaccurate treatment options or cures? So that whole disinformation campaign of take this and this will cure you or, you know, um, a lot of that's being uh, discussed in local news and on social media. So um, go ahead. There's so many different, uh, we actually just took on a client based out of Boston that will be combating this issue. Um, and uh, there are a number of things that are, that are creating a huge problem. Even the CDC is losing its reputation as a result of, uh, you know, so much information being out there. Um, part of what we're going to be doing is talking about the long-term health effects and pointing out to people various different instances, real stories about people who are suffering and later effects. I even have someone in my own family that started suffering blood clot issues um, after having experienced um, uh, you know, COVID-19. Um, and uh, you know, explaining to people that they're real, showing real stories, and then explaining the long-term health effects, I think can help push um, uh, good information and change perspective. I think when people, when it, when it starts hitting close to home, when you can start communicating things in a real way where, you know, you have somebody saying my aunt or my dad or my brother, um, and what this organization does really well is they've actually started implementing green zones in different regions. So not only are they going to share family stories, but they're going to show, share stories within your town. So if you're a person out in La Mesa and someone from La Mesa explains to you, this is what happened to me and my brother, then it becomes really real. A hundred percent agree with that. Those are, those are your ambassadors, right? To tell about the, the message, people that look like them that are in their neighborhoods that can tell the true story. Because COVID seems like something foreign when it's on TV and you see those numbers on the ominous tracker on the right hand side right? But when you actually know somebody, that's going to change people's minds. It's going to change the way they think. And now that our president has had it, I'm curious to see, Charles, what comes out of your, <laughs> your work. <laughs> um, this is more of a forward-thinking question. Uh, kind of what do we, what do, we do uh, as professionals in this world now of disinformation, in addition to just giving all the credit to um, to those who've organized this webinar series to really tackle this as a topic um, with thought leaders and those of us who are in the trenches every day. Um, do you see any techniques or tools you'd recommend to, um, yeah. for non-PR employees to combat disinformation or um, you know, media literacy, anything yeah. that you both recommend? Um, 
for me, I believe that at the end of the day, we all have our own code of ethics. Um, there's something that pulls at each one of our heartstrings. And uh, earlier this year, I worked with a local, not local, but a California uh, agency that was literally dealing with lies from a, a publication that was covering their region in California. And what we had, to, what we ended up doing was literally blasting a response to the whole publication and also incorporating their ethics within that email saying that you say that you're about this and this and this, but at, at the same time, you've done this, this, and this. And by blasting it out to everyone beyond the reporter, beyond the editor, everyone seeing that, you know what, we're not, maybe we need to take a look at this because there are some people that are going to uh, be upset um, that they were able to say, all right, well, we need to take a look at this. We're not just going to dismiss it. Um, so I think at the end of the day, there are people out there that have a code of everyone, organization, people wise, have, they have feelings, they have a code of ethics, and we need to begin to appeal to that, whether it's uh, the code of ethics of uh, public relations folks or journalists, I think um, it's critical that we begin to stress this within our everyday lives. If, if we're not getting it from everywhere, we've got to start to look within and say, look, are, what are the rules that you abide by and uh, you know, how can we hold you to them? Exactly. Not, not going low when others go low with it, right? What you want to be your brand. What do you believe in? And just like uh, PRSA's code of ethics, code of conduct, the military has one as well. That's always about timely and accurate information, always telling the truth. Um, so you've got to stick to that. But I also think it's really important for organizations um, as disinformation becomes way more widespread. In uh, environmental scanning is more important than ever. You got to understand what people are saying about you. There's no more ignorance is bliss kind of mindset because anyone can actually be affected by disinformation. And one of my favorite stories of that is in 2015, uh, there's a small turkey farm in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. It's Thanksgiving time and all of a sudden these tweets start going out saying that people are being poisoned by these turkeys, um, that they bought them from Walmart, in New York City, and it's uh, targeting minority populations there. And all these people are posting, I'm sick, I'm sick. Okay, this, this turkey farm had no idea what to do. They only have 200 employees. They probably didn't have a PR person on retainer. They didn't expect this, right? It's kind of like that crisis comm plan. Do you have a plan for disinformation? They didn't expect to have these tweeted. And oh yeah, they don't sell their turkeys at Walmart. So this is obviously um, something that's not true. Well, it com we come to find out that that was actually the Russians preparing for the 2016 election. They were trying to see how can we get something so viral. Their internet research agency decided to attack this turkey farm to see how do we get the people to believe it? How do we have these, these charged messages? So for all of us, we really got to understand that it's not just right? Chloe and the U.S. Navy against Iran, against China, against this and that. It's all of our businesses out there that can be affected by this. And if we're not monitoring it, it can quickly get out of control. Yeah, there was a stat that said something like <clears throat> nearly 25%, uh, I think it was, of um, a report from the Planck Center for Public Relations said that agencies and consultancies, uh, communications pros, were the most impacted by disinformation. Um, another survey found that as many as two out of 10 professionals said their companies had been impacted. Um, it seems like most of us think about the larger, like big brands being um, kind of impacted by this, but uh, there's also nonprofits out there and just kind of, they were sort of low on, the, on that list of threat. Um, do either one of you have any uh, any advice for those? Because oftentimes, like you said, Chloe, they don't really have the budget to be monitoring what's going on out there. Um, but uh, what do you have for anybody that's on this webinar? Any advice as part of the nonprofit world? I mean, I think it's a lot like uh, situational crisis communication theory, right? It's all about your reputation. Charles and I talked about that at the beginning. It's all about your reputation. Um, in that experiment that I talked about at the beginning of this panel, we found that the single largest predictor of people's post-event reputation, so how, how they fared if some, 
some entity put out disinformation against them was actually their pre-event reputation, right? That you can do everything, you can put out the statement, you can put the right picture, but ultimately people are gonna dig down deep and what do they think about when they think about your organization? So talking about these nonprofits that may not have a budget to, to have PR, to help them with a fancy statement and this and that, it's about trying to build a real authentic base and have them maybe be your ambassadors for you. Kind of like the COVID situation, right? If you can show people that have COVID that look like you, then maybe they'll take their advice. If you have people who are ambassadors of your organization that can relate to others, that's gonna help you win through this because statements don't always work. Sometimes the disinformation sticks around and that, that enough harms your, your organization. But how in the long term can you build up your reputation to be something people believe in? Yeah, I agree. Uh, one of the things that um, I am, I'm a big fan of was George Stephanopoulos, uh, who was Bill Clinton's press secretary, used to call it Zen spin, which is unspinning the spin language. Because people, are, people aren't dumb anymore. They read your, 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 your language and it's, you know, they can smell that, you know, all right, this person's saying too much. Just dial it back, dial it the other way. Um, and I, I'm constantly doing that. I've noticed that it's, I'm doing that more and more often with all of my clients. And it's telling them, look, just tell the truth and you know, step off the gas a little bit and just let the public know exactly what it is you're trying to, uh, what you're trying to say. And, and again, that, you know, doing that ahead of time, establishing your credibility, as Chloe and I keep saying, uh, pushing the perceived benefits of your organization, it's going to pay off in the long run. Every time you have a, su a success, every time you have an accomplishment, every time you have an opportunity to establish who you are and your benefit to the community, you need to put it out there because it's going to pay dividends. And That's I great. love the idea of imagery too. You know, if you can show them, if you can have a video, if you can take them on a tour and actually see your organization, right? Um, it does get a little hard in this world of deep fakes uh, where people can put out stuff anytime. But if you can actually show people your organization, if you can let them in, for us, when we can bring the public on an aircraft carrier for them to see exactly how we fight wars, I think that gives us that credibility because it's hard. It's hard building credibility when you're on a Zoom screen or you're just putting out press releases and this endless scroll of stories on, you know, AP or Reuters. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you actually show people? Yeah, your visual message is just as important as your verbal message, period. Especially in a day and age where, I, I think when I was in grad school, this, the sound bite was six seconds. I think maybe four years before that, it was 10. I'm sure it's like two now, right? Um, as, you're, as you're scrolling, that's all you got, the scroll. So it's probably a second. Um, but visual messages are so important. Do you, um, last question, I think, before I hand it over to Dr. Sweetser, um, do you have any, if you looked in your crystal ball as far as social media platforms go, um, do you think we'll see some change? This is a question from Andrew. Just, you think, do you think they play a role in the disinformation and, uh, you know, do you think they'll, they'll change their ways or just kind of curious? Okay, so I'm a huge lover of the First Amendment, right? I think that helps us all as PR practitioners be able to put out what's out there. What the trouble is, and a lot of people are saying, is social media should be held accountable for the spread of disinformation. But do we really want disinformation uh, to be decided on by social media companies? Should social media companies be the arbiters of truth when it comes to what's true and what's false? Especially when a lot of people believe things to be true, right? Um, so that's what makes it really hard. And you look at countries like Germany has this net DG law that pretty much makes it so that social media companies have, I believe, 48 hours to take down disinformation or they'll receive a fine. But who's deciding what's disinformation? I mean, look at us, even in our, our political candidates can't agree on what's the truth. And, they're, and everyone's on Team America, you know? So I think that's what's really hard with social media. So really the best way I think to combat it is make a smarter populace, do that media literacy, because if we're a society that keeps on telling people what to think instead of teaching people how to think, we're not gonna be 
top much longer. Yeah, I think the problem is our institutions are like always light years behind where, uh, I wouldn't say just corporate America, but where the technology is. You know, we still haven't had a telecom bill. We, we, we don't know how to address, uh, we're just now learning how to address social media, right? By making sure that some of these platforms are held accountable. But the second you, Twitter says it's gonna do something and then you have Parler pop up and it does something else, right? <laughs> um, I think the key is exactly what Chloe is saying and that, and that we have to be educated the same way we learned when we were in elementary school about primary, secondary and tertiary sources. People need to learn about, you know, what are the nuances when you're reading? What are the clues you should look for? How should you be actually extracting information from the stuff you're reading? Understanding that the point of it may not necessarily be to educate you, but to entertain you, right? Because we're all aware of all these ad dollars and everything else that, that's now looped into the matrix of the information that we're, uh, that we're reading. So um, I think for sure, we've got to get We've got to get educated on how to really get good information. Well, that's a great segue to Dr. Sweetser. Speaking of educators, uh, thank you for this opportunity, Dr. Sweetser. Excellent. Uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar today. We appreciate all that we learned from Barb in leading the discussion and, and then of course from Charles and Chloe themselves and uh, to the 100 plus attendees um, who took time out of their day to watch it live. You know, thinking of disinformation as a type of rumor campaign um, certainly takes the sting and the helplessness out of the situation for us as PR practitioners. Um, as PR professionals, it is heartening to know that our organization's reputation before the disinformation event can help dictate how we navigate through that crisis. Um, we learned a lot of great tips today, and I'll repeat some that we heard and then um, add a, a couple of little items um, to your personal PR list of how to fight disinformation for your company. Uh, research finds that there is no harm in repeating disinformation in order to push back on it. Corrections with counter arguments pushing back on disinformation can lead to debunking. You should do more than simply say X is not true. And you should illuminate with the truth instead. Uh, saying, starting your, your um, pushback with the truth is um, in a counter argument is actually effective. Refuting false claims in a fact-focused pushback reduces any lingering effects of that disinformation. And of course, as both uh, Chloe and Charles mentioned, um, fast corrections, especially those within the first 24 hours of the false information, really helps nip in the bud the problem before any malicious disinformation becomes that unintentionally spread misinformation uh, when Chloe walked us through the differences between those two. So if you missed a part of the webinar today or you just want to watch it again, because I know I'm going to, um, we will send out the playback video to you tomorrow. Our next Disinfecting Disinformation webinar is tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. And the registration link for that is in the chat box um, right now. Uh, we do hope that you'll join us for that. In leaving you, I'm going to ask that you please tell us what you thought about today to um, make sure that we know how to improve the webinar series as we move forward. After all, we are a school and we're based in continual improvement. Um, and so when you get a survey for this webinar, fill it out. Thank you so much for your time and go out there and keep your company's reputations clean. Take care. <laughs>